What's up, Detroit, Detroit, Detroit? Listen, this is your boy, comedian Mike Larry. We got the Collard Greens cook-off from 4 to 9, August 17th. Make sure y'all be here. We don't want no gritty greens. Well, all the grit, that's one thing you got to do. You got to wash them greens. And a lot of people like to season. Me, myself, I like the turkey tails in mine, man. So make sure y'all come out, man. Collard Green Cook-Off Competition. Sponsored by Bill Institute. Right in the neighborhood. The Hope Village community. We talking Linwood, Davidson, Dexter, and definitely 12th Street. Come on out August 17th from 4 o'clock to 9 o'clock. And remember, we got some blues for you too because nothing goes better with collard greens and some down-home blues. The queen of blues, that is, Thornetta Davis and also Luther Badman Keith. Check us out. Welcome back. Welcome back to the Detroit is Different podcast studios. And today, the summer's going on and we got so much more in store. So I'm bringing in some of the OGs, as they say. Somebody that's an OG to many OGs and a big homie to a lot of people, too. Um, organizing in the city uh, for, for years. Uh, definitely a connection in so many worlds. Athletics and sports. My favorite sport, basketball. Second is boxing, but he also has some ties there. Uh, also, nightlife, entertainment, uh, live events, and curating what that experience can be. Uh, somebody that was a close friend of my dear godmother, and he put her up as well. My other godmother, other than Mama Watson that just passed, was Mama Barnes or Thea Barnes. Uh, we love Mama Barnes. And also connected to um, actually serving a purpose and connecting young brothers to opportunity. Mr. Keith Bennett, how are you today? I am great. Thank you for having me. Okay, great is definitely an adjective that I think when you describe a day, not often used. Usually it's like things and places, but people, that's amazing. Yeah, I'm great. Okay. I'm in a great space, I'm going to be honest. All right, all right. So the, the Detroit is different classic rodeo. Let's get into some background. Okay. What grounded you to Detroit? Uh, first generation, second generation, how did your people, you end up in D? Well, my people came from Canton, Mississippi. Where is Canton, Mississippi? Close to Jackson, Mississippi. Okay. It's okay. in the northern part okay. of Mississippi. Uh, my grandfather came here in, 40, in 1940 hmm. after his dad was murdered hmm. by white guys because his dad was affluent, made money, but he also was a bolster. And so they found him in a ditch with an ax in his head. Wow. And so my grandfather just lost his desire to be down there, and so he heard about Ford Motor Company, like many people did. And so he came north, left his family, eight kids and his wife, his mother, and a brother down there. He soon asked his brother to join him up north, and he worked for Ford. And then two years later, he brought my grandmother and my mom and her seven siblings to Detroit. All right, so... Those stories uh, echo true in a lot of these stories that I get from Detroit is different. But like I always say, anything further west than Alabama, I always ask, why Detroit? Because a lot of people like Mississippi, Arkansas, you know, definitely Texas uh, and even further east, like Florida, Floridians end up in New York. A lot of that Mississippi is right there. In Chicago, hence the blues in Chicago sound a little bit different than the blues in Detroit. You know what I'm saying? And I love some Chicago blues. And that's true because the other part of their family, they, we came from a big family. They mm -hmm. went to Chicago. Yeah. So the other ones went to Chicago. And so it's, we always tore up 94 mm -hmm. all my life. We were up and down 94. Mm -hmm. I spent a lot of summers in Chicago, as much time as I spent in Detroit. Because the, the railway lines. Yes. That's where, like, it, it followed the railway lines. Yes, they did. You know, so, like, um, Mississippi, like, it's a lot of, even though Memphis right now, I don't know if Detroit know this, but Memphis is the city with the most black people in America right now. Yes. And um, a lot of people from, you know, a lot of Arkansas, a lot of Mississippi is right there in Memphis. Memphis. Like, you really feel that in yes. that, you know, and obviously people would say, well, they Southern in the first place. Or mm -hmm. the old school phrase from usually some old, older brothers like yourself would say, they still got cotton under their fingernails. <laughs> Statements like that. Yes, yes. <laughs> you know, yes. so having that essence, uh, what neighborhood? Uh, so the, uh, the story goes they lived on Bobian and uh, Wabash and Bobian. Mm, so right in the heart of it. Yes. And so um, they lived there a few years. Um, they moved to Linwood and McGraw. Right, on right, the, o right over closest to this way, but definitely more so like Zone 8 when yeah. we think about that. And that's the first place I remember them living. And mm. Esterbrook Middles, Esker, Esterbrook Elementary School was on the corner, and they were right next to Esterbrook. 
that's where I went to kindergarten at Exterbrook. Hmm. So we lived with them for a while. Okay. All right. So you and, and, and your parents, uh, I'm guessing uh, definitely. Parent. 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 Ah. Parent. Okay. Let's break that down. So my mom married my dad, mm-hmm. who after seven months, two years they had been married, but after seven months of seeing a family responsibility book. Mm. And so I didn't see him again until I was 10 at the Chicago train station. As his sister was taking me to Mississippi, she introduced me to him. Then I went to the other end of the bench and fell asleep. Hmm. And we never even had a conversation. I saw him again when I was 35, the day my biological son was born. Wow. So I only had one parent. Hmm. My mom raised me. Okay. All right. Your father, do you know anything about his background? Yes. Um, he has an aunt. Uh, I, well, I have an aunt that's his sister still living, 98 years old. Mm, so she made sure that I knew that's a blessing. the family. And no one in my family ever said anything negative about my dad. Mm-hmm. All they talked about was he had natural curly hair. He was handsome, mm-hmm. jet black, pretty teeth. Never heard anything negative about my dad all my years. The only thing my mom would say is he didn't want to work. He didn't want mm-hmm. a responsibility. Other than that, so I always knew I knew his, his dad. Uh, visit his dad in Macomb, Mississippi. And uh, where is Macomb, Mississippi? Macomb, Mississippi is further south, probably an hour, hour and a half from Biloxi. Mm. Yeah, and he lived. So he came like, from a town like, called Bear Town. Okay. Yeah, because they used to have bears that came through there a lot. So mm. yeah, so that's so I split my time between Macomb, Canton, and Detroit for summers, but I was here. Yeah, with my mom. Okay, what was Mississippi like back then? Oh, it was, it was horrible. Because my mom was even, the first time my aunt wanted to take me there, I was eight years old. And my mom was just frightful. And I didn't even know the story of Emmett Till at that point in time. I couldn't understand her fear. Mm-hmm. And so the whole train ride down there, my aunt was saying, I can't let anything happen to you. My mother's name was Claudia. Claudia would kill me. And so my mother kind of prepped me when I went down there because I had a habit I wasn't one of these kids that had, was raised that I had to say yes, ma'am, and no, ma'am. I would say, yeah, in a minute. <laughs> and she would straighten me up, up about that, but it just slipped a lot. She said, when you get down south, it's yes, ma'am, and no, ma'am. Yes, sir. You don't, you don't say yeah. And so when I went down there, I was hit with that. Number one, you get off the train, and the first thing you see is colored on it. Mm. Never seen that in my life before. Water mm-hmm. found and people grabbing you and saying, don't go over there. Restrooms colored only. And so I had a couple encounters down there where people asked me questions, white people. And I would, I was a creature of habit. Yeah. And they would say, what did you say, boy? Mm-hmm. And then I had to remember, no, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. So it was great being down there because I saw farmland. My aunt who lived down there had a huge farm. Uh, was very well known. What did they grow? They grew corn. They do everything. Mm-hmm. Corn is what I remember. I remember they grew watermelons. I remember they grew uh, a lot of beans, uh, cabbage, things of that nature, uh, slot pigs. I had to slot pigs. Everybody had to get up at the crack of dawn. Was it, uh, 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 was it agricultural or was it more so farming to eat? Farming to eat. Mm-hmm. But they also own the tavern. They own the mm-hmm. tavern. And my grandfather lived about, which would be about two blocks from them, three blocks. He owned a cafe. So I saw entrepreneurship at eight years old. I'm seeing them uh, farm, entrepreneurship, and I'm seeing them become very successful. And they were very popular people. So when I'm walking through the dusty roads and the Dirt rolls down there. People would look at me who that had never met me and say, you Mr. Tom's boy, ain't you? Mm. How do you know that? Yeah, you Mr. The Tom. shape of your head type stuff. Yeah. And mm. so uh, just the look and everything. I looked a lot like my dad, and I looked a lot like my grandfather. And it's interesting. It's, uh, I got family from Vicksburg, Mississippi. Oh, okay. I've been there. And uh, definitely like off the riverboat and some of that tavern and and I always would ask um, my grandma Vail, I'm like, so what was it like? She was, you know, and I always just envisioned it looking like, um, you know, the, um, the, 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 
I guess my Rainey's uh, play that just played, but mm-hmm. more so like uh, in the color purple, where Suge Avery sing. Like I always thought like that, but it was a lot more. Well, that like was my clean, grandfather's. You know place, what I'm saying? Because you could look down and see the ground mm. while you sitting in the tavern. Yeah, so that was his place. Okay, you know, that was his place. Yes. Okay, and uh, what what type of entertainment did he have there? Uh, he had a jukebox. Uh, when I was able to go there, now at night. Young people couldn't come around. So, oh, so you I'm don't there, even know what was going no, on. I didn't that. know what was going on. He had okay. a jukebox. That's all I knew. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. Uh, so, so during that, how many summer was there? Like you, you went down south for like every like other eight summer until to... I was turned in a teenager. Every other okay. summer. Yeah. All right. And then at teenage, uh, what did you take up? Um. Really, I was in a great community. So let me share this with you. We lived on Philadelphia and Wildermere. P-Town. Yes. Then we moved around the corner to Pingree and Wildermere. Staying in P-Town. My grandparents lived until they died on Northwest between Dexter and Grand River. Mm. And so I had an uncle that lived off of Claremont and Dexter. Wow. And so I lived, I saw, I lived around the corner from John Conyers. Yeah. I lived two houses down from Tony Brown. Hmm. So I lived around the corner from Larry Washington, who was one of the Ford executives in NAACP. This mm-hmm. was a community that I grew up with. I didn't need a dad. Hmm. I didn't even understand what I was missing because I had men to look up to. I was delivering flyers for John Conyers when I was seven, eight years old when he's running. Okay. All right. And let's, let's unpack that. As uh, people know, I'm going to say it again. I was the president of Northwestern for a long time. So yes. with that, I know some of these Northwestern stories and just kind of matching your age. I don't know if a lot of people know the way that, um, and some of this was from Monica Lewis Patrick, as she's the niece of the great Willie Horton. Yes. Um, but she even told on her Detroit is Different the story of like, okay, it was really sought after to make sure that Willie was well taken care of, even in his Northwestern journey, that those same men stepped up as big homies. So Damon Keith as well. So a lot of Northwestern elites, Clyde Cleveland, Damon Keith, John Conyers and others stepped up and said, look, we're going to wrap our arms around mm-hmm. Willie to make sure that Willie gets on a path of what success could be. And God knows, I don't even know what other discussions they were having with Olympia Field, the Tigers, and Mm -hmm. Tiger Stadium, and all of that stuff, because we we don't put this in the right perspective, but Willie Horton was like a LeBron James for Detroit in in the time. So so when he played at Northwestern, I was snagging ball. I'm like the ball boy at practice. Are you serious? Yeah, I'm serious. So uh, uh, Teasley was a coach over there, Ron Thompson. The Big Ron was over there at that Mm. time. There were a lot of people. Northwestern at that time was the Mecca to me. I mean, to most people. And I know this sounds crazy because I'm graduated 2001, but when I was the president, Northwestern rivaled. I know people hate to hear me say this, but it rivaled Cast Tech as far as, like, the programming, uh, the the, the lacrosse or the field hockey teams. uh, Olympic-sized swimming pool. Yeah. Yeah. The resources into the school yes. that were poured into the school. Yes. And I'm always like my mom went to Central and so many other people, okay. you know, Godmother. <laughs> well, I'm the only one that did. And I, in my family, I'm the only one. My mom graduated from Northern. Okay. But her siblings graduated from Northwestern. So I'm around there when Soul Day was, was first started. Pee Wee. Shout Pee-wee out Pee Wee. That's right. Mm-hmm. That's right. I'm around there with Ernest Winchester. Mm. I'm around there with Sam Poole. I'm around there with all of them, you know. And so I'm growing up. The ice hockey. Most people don't realize there was ice skating on Northwestern next to McMichael Junior High School for years. There was an ice house there where you warm up at. Mm -hmm. We would see, this is no legend or or urban, you would see Smokey Robinson getting warm in the house. You would see the Supremes. They would ice skate, and then they would come in the house with us to get warm and go right back Mm -hmm. out on the skating rink. So that's the neighborhood that I grew up. I walked down Wildermere to McMichael every day. Wow. And, and, and let me put this in a, in a frame of reference, too. So people see the Motown Museum. A lot of those Motown band players and people that toured came straight from Northwestern, yes, too, in that program. Um, shout out Ray Parker Jr. He speaks a lot more about what that music yes. program is, mm-hmm. you know, uh, and and what that represented to Motown, but even over and beyond, like just that footprint at one point in time, you had Northwestern 
in this footprint of Olympia, and Olympia itself was the premier. I get, what would we say? Entertainment, sports venue. Yes, because that's where the Ice Capades came. That's where the Beatles came. Red that's Wings. Elvis Presley. Yeah. Um, Jackson Five. Jackson Five. Um, that's where everybody, even even the Crocs started there. That was mm-hmm. when they had their big fights fights there first. And so then across the street from Northwest, and you know this, they had the Fisher YMCA. Mm. So that was huge then. You would see, you would see executives, corporate executives who were black at that time. Some of the first ones, that's where they would go play handball. That's where they would use the swimming, the sauna. To them, that was their DA, D, DAAC. Yeah, mm. That was there. The because at one point, I don't know if a lot of people know this, but Coleman Young broke that barrier because at DAC, like a lot of stuff in Detroit, didn't let black people in until like the 80s. Yes. So, you know what I'm saying? So, you know, uh, but you're not going to have something like that with a Coleman Young administration no. happening. No. no. So... You're looking at this politically, but I want to talk a little bit about you being connected. You said ball boy. So obviously Willie got you by some days, but what was, how intentional was it to watch uh, a collection of elders pour into like a young man with talent and help guide what his path was be? And did you even recognize that that was I didn't recognize it for what it was at that point in time. I knew he was special because everybody looked at him as being special. I knew that he always had, people were always talking to him, you know, um, and so I knew that. I knew more about John Mayberry, Mm. who came later, you know, and some of those guys. I knew them intimately at different times. And so I knew his brother Mark Mayberry was there as well. And so when I went to uh, McKenzie High School, People at Northwestern didn't even recognize or realize I was at McKenzie for two mm. years because they assumed that I was, went to North, that was Northwestern. Yeah, they assumed that. Okay, so let's now talk about, uh, even before we get there, your mom. What was your mom doing? What, where did she work? What was, what was her path during this time as you're coming to age? My mom was 5'2", and her, at her heaviest, maybe 110 pounds. Mm. The toughest woman that I ever met. I seen her deliver phone books. Yellow Pages to feed us. Mm. I saw her go out to Groves Point and clean floors, polish floors, and mop floors, and then make me come, then bring me home and make me do the same thing at home. Mm-hmm. So I learned my work ethic from my mother. Um, was blessed enough. She worked in Montgomery Wards. Blessed enough to get in Chrysler at maybe 1966, 67. Mm-hmm. And so uh, at that time, we were living on Pingree. 3226 Pingree. I always tell people you got to remember where you came from so you know where you're going. 3200 West Philadelphia, 9438 Ravenswood, 18976 Stansbury. So I can track my mother's progression till we bought our first home at 15 years old. She was so focused on church, God, and making sure that I didn't have an excuse for how I matriculated and matured. That's all she focused on. She gave up nightlife many years of her life. I used to beg her. I used to plead her to get a boyfriend because I wanted her to get off me. (laughs) Hilarious. Yes. And so she was a very focused lady, very strong, very spiritually strong woman. But a woman who had, when she died, she had nine Bibles in the house and seven that she used religiously. But she would talk to you about the Bible and teach Sunday school with you at the dinner table while she was drinking a Budweiser. What, um, that's... It reminds me of so many people that I can think of as well. Yes. Um, what church? I went to a little storefront. We we first lived in, uh, I should have corrected myself, she and I and my dad lived with some relatives in Black Bottom. Mm-hmm. And so we lived on Russell and Frederick. And uh, we had a little storefront church right around the corner on Russell. We lived on Frederick. We lived which was it was a, a grocery store market on the corner, and it was a slaughterhouse where we could actually hear pigs being slaughtered. You could smell them all day. As kids, we played with their guts in the alley. That sounds like something that boys would definitely do. That's what we did. And that definitely sounds like something that like a mom would see, like, what are you doing? Oh, you used to get blessed out about it. You used to get blessed out about it. Mm-hmm. And so that's where we went to church. It was a little storefront. My uncle was the pastor. Uh, my great uncle was the pastor. My father's uncle was mm-hmm. the pastor. So I never heard anything negative because I always was in contact with my dad. With the family. family. Right. 
-hmm. And so then they moved on 32nd Horatio when, of course, Freeway came through. Mm. And that removed us from Black Bottom as well as our church and everything. And they moved, uh, relocated on 32nd Horatio in southwest Detroit. And so um, when we ended up leaving Black Bottom, we moved to my grandparents' house. Mm -hmm. And then we moved around on Ferry Park in 14th. And what oh, okay. they had row houses then, or brownstones or whatever they were, mm -hmm. then we lived in two different places in that little area. So I grew up in that area too. And so the northwestern area, the McMichael area. That's been your footprint. That's, that's my footprint. Okay. White's Records and yeah. a oh, lot of yes, that. Yes, yeah. And then my mom's boyfriend at the time, at the time, had a record store, Rick's, mm. right there on Lintwood at 14th itself. TV. That's something. Yeah. So, yeah. Linwood 14, like Linwood. Okay. Yeah. Okay. All right. So, with that, now I can get to the other question. Mm -hmm. Like I say, my favorite sport. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Curtis Blow, shout out. Basketball is yes. my favorite sport. How did you end up in that basketball space, especially seeing all of this baseball in front of you? Yeah. So, and then I played baseball every day. And so, okay. what happened was I would hear the stories of, from my uncles and his friends about Curtis Jones. Ah, the great, okay. The great Northwestern. Guy had arguably, as they still speak of Kurt Jones' talent, like, you know, and Spencer Haywood. And I don't know if people even put in framework of how good Spen Spencer Haywood was so good, he broke the rule of, like, yeah, we want to draft that guy straight, straight out of high school. Like, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. so, like, as much as I said Willie Horton was, like, LeBron yes. James, like, Spence was – Spence – Spencer Haywood – was a man playing with like almost like Shaquille O'Neal yeah. or something. Yeah. The, the the stories I hear and even looking at the stat lines and things like mm -hmm. that. And the one person that Spencer Haywood spoke of, like the best basketball player I've seen, and this was after he was in the NBA. So mm -hmm. it wasn't like, you know, you playing high school and stuff like this. Is like okay, Magic Johnson, Kareem, Kurt Jones. Mm -hmm. So let's talk about Kurt. So the names I would hear as a young kid before I really was interested in basketball, of course. At that time, the NBA only came on Sundays on <laughs> CBS. Mm -hmm. And it was, it was tape delay. So yes. tape delay means they shot it, yeah, it not, was edited, it yeah. wasn't live, and you kind of you could look in the newspaper and know who won, yeah. and then you had to watch the you game. You had to watch the game. Mm -hmm. And so um, I would hear Reggie Harden. Mm -hmm. I would hear Freddie Prime, mm -hmm. Curtis Jones, and Spencer Hayward. Mm -hmm. And so anytime I could get someone to take me to go see any of those guys, I would be the kid that's – just happy to be there, just to be at. So when Curtis played at Northwestern, I was finding a way to get in that gym to see the great Curtis Jones. And at this time, did you, was it like, I want to see Kurt Jones, or was it like you were starting to fall in love with basketball more than baseball? No, I, no at that time, I still loved baseball. Mm -hmm. I thought that's the only game it was, was baseball. But what mm -hmm. happened was, is that I fell in love with the complexity of basketball. Mm-hmm. And so from that point on, I became a, like a junkie at the Fisher YMCA, hanging out at the gym with the high school guys. They pushing me away. And, you know, I'm asking them questions and things of that nature. And, and let me get this right for the framing, too. So loving basketball then would be like the people that are very passionate about soccer. Yes. So it was – there was an audience, but it was still a little bit more niche. It was mm -hmm. boutique. It was like its own culture within a culture of things. And so we live, at this point, we're living at 9438 Ravenswood mm -hmm. off of, near Grand River and Joy Road. And so right after the riot, mm -hmm. St. Cecilia's opened up, Sam Washington. Hmm. And so I started hearing the kids in the neighborhood talk about, oh, they're playing ball, basketball mm -hmm. over at St. Cecilia's. And so I'm going to my mom like, I'm, and St. Cecilia's might have been, a mile away, I'm mm -hmm. like, Mom, I'm gone. I'm going up to the gym. And so I would stay so long, she would come driving looking for me. Hmm. And she would have to get, pull me out of the gym. And so. And I also had this question because it's no YouTube, it's not that popular. No. Um, how are you learning form? And then also, like, you know, I watch the old tapes and like dribbling and stuff. Mm -hmm. Like, you've loved basketball for so long, you've almost seen the maturation of yes. moves, styles, uh, complexity, Let strategies. Let me share this play. with you. I'll be 70 years old in two years. That's basketball is only 76 years old. So I've seen <laughs> it. I've seen it. 
<laughs> and I tell the young guys that when they're questioning me and they want to debate, yeah. I say, oh, hold on, hold on, hold on. And, and so you, you get as many social media basketball debates. Yeah. <laughs> and so I saw, I heard Curtis Jones is up at St. Cecilia. Mm -hmm. Then you would hear Dave Bing is at St. Cecilia. Mm -hmm. Then you would hear Spencer Haywood is at St. Cecilia's. Mm -hmm. And so when I walked in St. Cecilia's, you walked in and you saw the community. Mm -hmm. I would see uh, Dr. Uh, Robert Sims, who owned the Sims Young Clinic at, at Claremont and uh, Linwood. Mm -hmm. You see all the businessmen. I would see Tony Brown up there. And so I got intrigued about that game. Mm -hmm. And so uh, spent Was it like a level of cool and, and that started like, like what age would you say you started looking like, hmm, I'm paying way more attention to basketball as opposed to baseball? Yeah, by that time I had – Forgot about baseball. So about 15, 16, I'm guessing? Yeah. And so when I entered McKenzie High School, of course, uh, and let me share this with you, the story about how I got to McKenzie. So I go to Northwestern the first day because mm -hmm. I'm supposed to go to Northwestern. Yeah, the north neighborhood. So, so when I come home, I'm getting ready to go up on my porch. We live in a two-family flat, and it's a car with me and sitting in it, and they say, hey, son. Tell me, yeah. You live there? Yes. Where you go to school? I go to Northwest. No, you don't. You go to McKenzie. Hmm. I'm like, no, I go to Northwestern. They said, no, you go to McKenzie. Is your mom home? I said, I don't know. I haven't been upstairs yet. I got to see. See if she's home. If she don't, ask her to come down. So I go up there and I tell her, I said, some guys in the car and her antennas went up. You got that right. Down. So she mm -hmm. come down and she, I mean, my mother was five too, but she's ready to go. Yeah. And so they said, you his mom? And they said, yes. She said, well, why is he going to Northwestern? She said, because all his people went to Northwest. She said, he lives in McKenzie's district. Doesn't he know all his friends go to McKenzie? She said, yeah, I'm sure he does. They said, well, he, tomorrow he's going to be at McKenzie. <laughs> She's looking at them like, and, they, and so Coach Richmond, who was in the car at that time, said, oh, we'll have a conversation with Doc Luby. I don't know who Doc Luby is, and my mother didn't either. They said, ma'am, he needs to be at McKenzie. Who's Doc Luby? Doc Luby, I think, was the super over athletics or a big guy in the mm. De Detroit public school. Okay. So they had, and so the story is that when the, after the riots, McKenzie needed to be integrated mm -hmm. because it was almost all white school and area. So they recruited Coach Richmond to come there to bridge that gap and to socialize the school into cultural lives. So this is like uh, that Denzel Washington movie, Remember the Titans type thing. Yes. And so mm -hmm. Coach Richmond brought Coach Dozier later, and so he was the first person there. And so she had heard of Coach Richmond before. So as we're going upstairs, she said, well, maybe you should go to McKenzie. And I'm like, I don't have no problem. All, my boys, all mm -hmm. my boys is over there. That's fine. Mm -hmm. That's how I got uh, to McKenzie. That's how I got to McKenzie. Mm. Yeah. Okay, so what was your team like then? Because, you know, I'm later on and, like, you know, good stag teams. Ricky, shout out Ricky, shout out um, shout out Cal Wu. Like, well, well, I done seen some good McKenzie well, basketball. What, what happened was I had heard of some legends at McKenzie um, be, before I, I got there. But what happened was um, I, I was the ball boy. Mm. Mm -hmm. So I wasn't coming straight home from school. And my mom wanted to know where, where you at. I'm like. I'm, I'm up at the gym. What gym? St. Cecilia's is closed. I said, I'm at McKenzie. What are you doing? I said, I'm just up there with the team. I would never describe what I'm just up there with the team. So I became a ball boy one year. Mm -hmm. The next year, I became a student manager. Mm -hmm. The next year, I devised a analytics sheet before analytics were even thought of that could break the game down and measure the effectiveness of players you was like, on the uh, game. You were like Eric Spostra before tape yeah. or something. Yeah, and so I showed mm -hmm. it to one of Coach, the coaches. Coach Richmond. Mm -hmm. No, Coach Dozier. Mm -hmm. And then I showed he showed it to Coach Richmond. Coach Richmond showed it to Sam Washington, who showed it to a guy who was at Northwestern, Jim Boyce. Mm. And so they all want to know who is this guy. <laughs> yeah, and it's like he a student. That, yeah, he a student. Mm -hmm. And so I became the statistician, and I became well-known because I – Worked at St. Cecilia's all summer. I worked 75 hours a week wow. for $50. Wow. I was there when it opened. It was there when it closed. Seven days a week. Didn't know what a picnic was. My mother saw me give up my entire life for basketball. Mm. And so I got to meet college coaches. 
I got to meet Dave Bing. I got to meet Bob Lanier. And so by me being close to Sam Washington, a lot of people, because we were both big, thought I was his other son. Hilarious. And so um, I did everything there. I was a scorekeeper. I was even announcing games. You think if you talk to some of the old St. Cecilia players, they'll tell you I was John Mason before John Mason. Hmm. Okay. When Durai played up there, I sounded uh, Terry like N- NBA basketball. When, when uh, Campy mm. Russell played mm. up there, my call okay. was Russell, and I would let it go. Mm-hmm. So I was doing that. But the thing about it was that because I was on McKenzie's bench, Sam Washington who were, and Ron Hall, Ron Hall was over the state AAU, mm-hmm. amateur basketball. So they would carry me on the road with them. And he just starts calling me an assistant coach. Hmm. And he would start asking me, all of the coaches would ask me, what did you see? What did you see at halftime? And this is, and this is so like. I'm still in high school. You're still in high school, but also this is like before, like even the books on basketball don't even really have yeah. games and strategies right. and stuff like, you know, like. And, and, and we may get into a debate because I love basketball, as you all are seeing in this discussion. Yeah. Like. You know the classic, like, oh man, them old guys can't play and da 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 da. But uh, uh, a lot of some of those winning, especially those old Celtics teams, when a, when you watch the tapes, like, Red Auerbach was out coaching so much of the competition that some of the play, like, some of the players had way more talent. It's just the schemes. But, so you were developing schemes and strategies at a time when, uh, like, this is unprecedented. So what people don't understand about Red Auerbach Ar- is that, yeah, they played a structured game, but he allowed his team to fast break too. Mm-hmm. He was one of the first coaches that allowed teams to fast break, especially white coaches that allowed yeah. teams to fast break. Uh, I would really say Will Robinson was the first mm-hmm. to ever do that. Um, and so I started meeting all the coaches. Then I started, I don't know if you knew that Josh Giles Shaw College used to practice at Northwestern and play their home games as a black college. I hear I hear so much about Shaw College, which Detroit is different. I would love if you may be able to introduce me to more of it because there was a Kwame Kenyatta interview okay. when he spoke about Shaw College and some of the organizing they would do there. Yes. And Pee Wee would be supportive of it. Yes. Because he'd say, like, yeah, we'd be talking to thugs and gang leaders uh, yes. and, and just connecting through Shaw. But Shaw was one of those places. Yes. And similar to, I'm a Lewis College of Business uh, graduate, but okay. similar right. to that same track, mm-hmm. some of these schools and institutions started popping up to to feel the need of support from black people stepping into roles is like, you know, especially like wars. The Korean War, World War II was mm-hmm. needed to fulfill certain things. So, Shot College migrated out of, from Michigan Lutheran. It was called Michigan Lutheran at first, hmm. and then Shaw College birthed out of that. Mm-hmm. And so I can put you in touch. My uncle, who's probably 75, he went mm-hmm. to Shaw College, graduated from Shaw College. He was the first college graduate in our family from mm. Shaw College. And his wife went to Shaw College. So our, there are sh- people that know how it got it mm-hmm. formed and things still around. And so Josh Giles, who was the coach, and Josh was like 6'8", big guy. So he started carrying me on the road with him. So I went down to Kentucky State as it's like a statistician. So you end up getting becoming, in high school, yeah, in high a school. college coach too. Yeah, in high school. Just and by the, your skill set and, and your, as they say, a basketball junkiness yeah. became strategy. And so Rich, Coach Richmond started calling me an assistant. When he would talk to other coaches in the Detroit public school, he would say, my assistant. He wouldn't say statistician. And mm-hmm. so coaches started giving me respect that I really didn't understand. I knew mm-hmm. every head coach in the PSL, personally, wow. Wow. personally, who mm-hmm. would give me respect if I walk in the gym, mm-hmm. who would give me, because of Sam Washington, uh, Elbert Richmond, Jim Boyce, Ron Hall, Josh Guy. How did the players take to it? Because you're a peer, you know what I'm saying? Like, how did the players take to your, I guess, oh, your strategies and schemes? I got called all kind of names when I was doing that, from suck ass to Hilarious. <laughs> everything. <laughs> you know, I got called everything. But they knew I knew basketball. Uh-huh. And, and if they wanted to get something to the head coach, they would whisper in my head, Bennett, mm-hmm. Bennett. And nobody called me Keith back then. They called me by my left. Bennett, will you tell coach this? Will you tell coach that? Because they knew they listened to me. Mm-hmm. And so even would send me out to scout for them. Mm-hmm. Bennett, go and see Cooley play. Cody and tell us what you see. 
Mm-hmm. Let's go over with the football coach. He used to drive me when I didn't have a car. So, so like I say, this is still so unprecedented. Yeah, I'm in high school. Like, but I'm just saying, not even you just being impressed. Like, it's not a lot of information and data of even knowing what to do. How did you come up with, which I guess this is more to your creativity, like the schemes, how were you seeing so much that so many other people didn't see? Now, when I say this, a lot of people kind of hesitate. It was God. Hmm. Kyrie, it was God. People ask me even then and now, how did you do that? I had a young man say, how did you go from a high school, listen to what I'm saying, a high school assistant to a college coach and hadn't graduated and hadn't, I mean. Graduated hadn't, high school. No, had, no, I had graduated high school, okay. and it's a story to that. But I hadn't been to college. Mm. So that was a usual progression that if you were an ex um, Big Ten player, then you would be a grad assistant, and yeah. then you would go up, you graduate. It still happens now. Yeah, yeah. you, you, you kind of work your way through yes. usually. But I bypassed all that. Mm. So I went from McKenzie's bench to a college coach. Okay. Now, and then with it, like I say, these material, you know what I'm saying, in – and one of the the thirty for thirty, a lot of people were watching the, um, and I'm sure you had stories and met him too, just mm-hmm. him being a piston. But when Dennis Rodman's story of how he looks at rebounding is told a little bit in that Last Dance documentary, mm-hmm. ESPN did a thirty for thirty on him, and he was just talking about just the way that he would watch. Like it's a lot of physics geometry and knowing angles. basketball where he said I was never fighting for a rebound I was fighting to get to the spot where I knew the ball would fall just from studying the way the the it would bounce the from like he knew Mark Price Larry, where, where Larry Bird George I'm like it, and that's muscle memory too because he was sitting there like photoshop and all of that in his in his mind so with me I wouldn't have passed algebra if I didn't look at the court as angles Right angles, triangles, and that's how I passed algebra. I could look at my algebra problem as a basketball court uh, problem, and that's how I figured it out. It was all God. And I have players now. I remember when Boston was playing New Jersey a couple of, year, a couple of years ago, and they clamped down on KD. Remember? Mm-hmm. They took him out. And so guys were calling me, how did they do that? I said, watch the feet. Y'all looking up here. They took his foot space away from him. I said, KD has, number one, has big feet. He likes big strides. So they took his foot space away. They, they actually defense him from the knees down. People were like, how do you know that? I said, I'm Because you've been there. doing this for forever. Yes. Yes. And so, uh, so the story goes like this. I should have graduated in June 1973. Mm-hmm. And so I get a letter. I get home, and we lived in a two-family flat, and I walked up the stairs came in the dining room, my mother sitting at the dining room table, and she looked angry. And she said, sit down. So I sat down. And she slid this paper across the table. She said, read that. Tell me what that means. So I read it. Detroit Public School, Principal, McKenzie High School, Harry, uh, what was his name? Harry Gilmore wants to see Mrs. Bennett and Keith Bennett in his office as soon as possible to discuss these matters. She says, what's that all about, son? And I gave the answer that most young kids give. I don't, know. I don't know. She mm-hmm. said, son, you don't know what this is all about? I, said, I don't have a clue. You sure? I said, I don't have a clue. Mm-hmm. You know I got to take off from work mm-hmm. at Chrysler to go and talk to your principal? And so when we get there, um, at that time in the principal's office, you had these long wooden benches. So we sitting outside the office on this bench, and it seemed like it was forever. And all of a sudden the principal's door opened up, and he looked over and he said, Claudia? And she said, Harry, I said, oh, shit, they know each other. <laughs> That's funny. And so he invited us in, and he told her that Keith is supposed to have graduated in June coming up. He's not going to graduate. He doesn't have enough hours. She's sitting there crying her eyes out. Mm. I mean, it's not everything. And she's mm. telling him, like, I gave him my lunch money so he would have Chuck Taylor so he could mm. do this. And he's not... And he's, I mean, it's, I mean, it's drawn out. He's telling, he said, but hold on now. The athletic department and teachers have stepped up for Keith. Mm -hmm. They say he's very popular, Mm -hmm. brilliant in athletics. They say he's raised more money Mm. for our athletic department than any student that's ever been at McKenzie. Mm -hmm. They say, and so what we're going to do is we have a plan. 
that we're going to send him to Cass Tech Night School. At that time, he had adult ed. Mm -hmm. And he's going to finish up there, and he's going to come out next January. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to be honest with you. I'm sitting there like, well, this ain't that bad, bad you know. And then he said, uh, and we don't want him sitting around all day when school start back next September. So we got him a job. And I'm like, damn, I didn't made it out. Mm. And so the job was being a hall monitor because mm. the principal said, you know where everybody skips. You know where every door they come in, mm. where they're playing uh, cards and all of that. So you're going to come here and work during the day. So you, you became, as the streets would say, an informant. I'm just messing <laughs> <laughs> No, I didn't do that. Cause that's, they did tell me that. They, they didn't want me to come back uh -huh. because I was so popular. They wanted me to tell other kids, if you don't do what you're supposed to do, you're going to be like me. You're going to still be I back. I Mm -hmm. You're going to still be back. And so I did graduate uh, in January. I was assistant coach officially at that time, mm -hmm. at that time. And two years later, co between Coach Richmond and a guy named um, Bob Knight. Not, um, not Bobby Knight. Not Bobby Knight, the one that was at, no. And so he was at Indiana State. He was actually Larry Bird's coach. And Coach mm -hmm. Richmond, and, who knew Mel Daniels, who came from mm -hmm. Detroit, yeah. were very close. Coach Richmond sold him on me as being a possible assistant on his bench. And so this coach said, well, we go over junior college that's just about 30 minutes away from us need a coach. And we think he's an excellent guy. And we already had a guy from McKenzie down there, Michael uh, Setback Gray. I think he's ready to go down there and lead this team. Wow. And that's how I went down. And I took a few uh, Detroit guys with me. It was a town of 26,000. Robinson, Illinois. Mm -hmm. The only black people were down there, the guys that were on the team. Then I went to East St. Louis because they were worried about the black guys fraternizing with the white women. So I had to go to East St. Louis and recruit black women for the nursing program. And I told the principal mm -hmm. at that time, I said, you know they call this prostitution. Mm -hmm. I'm going down here to get women so they can... Through this, I said, this is this is uh, the John Calipari scandal. Yes, so, <laughs> Rick but we had started scandal. getting complaints in that <laughs> town about yeah, I know. the black guys. But I would tell the uh, the townsfolk, no, the girls come here at night at the dorm chasing these guys down. Yeah, and so I mean, we know it's a story as old as time. Yes, you know. Yes, and so I started coaching there. We won thirty of the thirty three games that wow. year. We finished. First, we won the state championship. You weren't even twenty one. No. We went to the national tournament, finished mm. third in the nation. Mm. Larry Bird practiced with us for a while because that was his red shirt year. Mm. Then I went back and coached another year, and I was supposed to go to Indiana State during Larry Bird's senior year, but I got recruited by Dick Vitale and Smokey Gaines to come back Interesting. to Detroit. I was – okay, and I was actually watching uh, – this is how much I like basketball. So Big Ten Network was playing some information about Rutgers. And mm -hmm. to me, I think they added Rutgers to the Big Ten because they wanted to be in the New York market. Mm -hmm. That's like that sports business oh, yeah. stuff. That's but in it, they're telling the story of Dick Dittel being in Rutgers, and then he comes to Detroit. Yes. And they were saying, like, that team before he came to Detroit was like a pretty – Big team, good team, and, you know, all, all, all that. was years you wouldn't have wanted uh, Ruck, Ruckers in the Big Ten because they were winning. They had, like, yeah. Phil Sellers. They had some great players at one time. So he comes to Callahan Hall, mm -hmm. and you in that mix. With well, not right away. Mm -hmm. He had came years earlier and mm -hmm. started winning. That's when they had a pack. That, you couldn't get near Callahan. Callahan Hall when U of D was playing basketball. Mm -hmm. But I had free pass. Now, if I want because of all your 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 basketball, yeah, and he knew me, and, yeah. and a lot of the times, what people don't know, Dick was a guy that was hard to keep him focused. He was what you see on TV. Yeah, that's really how that, he is. That's real. And so, a lot of times, I was asked to come in the car with him and Smokey to drive to see a recruit if it was mm -hmm. close by in Ohio, and then I would I had license, I would drive him, mm -hmm. and so he knew of me well, mm -hmm. you know. And so there were times. When I had conversations with him, you know, he knew me. And so, actually, it was he had stepped down when I got there. He had stopped coaching because he had ulcers. And really, he didn't take losing well at all. And I was going to say, usually just the stress. I mean, coaching yes. is stressful on a lot of levels. So, he had become the athletic director. Mm -hmm. And so, Dave Gaines, Smokey Gaines, had taken over as head coach. So, mm -hmm. Smokey was the one that pressed for me to come back. Mm -hmm. Dick signed off on it and said, yeah, that's the guy you should bring in. But as I'm walking in the door, Dick has took the pissing job. 
mm. and had become the Pistons head coach. The only conversation I had with him was two conversations. First time he saw me, he said, get your fucking hair cut. So I used to have a big fro. Big, the big afro. Yeah. Then I went and got it cut, and he saw me two days later. I said, didn't I tell you get your fucking hair cut? I said, Dick, I, go get it cut. And then the next conversation, he said, I just want to tell you that I'm leaving. I want to tell you face to face. I'm going to, now, you can come with me, but Smokey wants you here with him. I said, I'm staying mm-hmm. with Smokey. So that was just my Dick Vitale. So um, were you there? Was like Terry Mills on that team? Who were the players on that team? On the, no, uh, on that team was uh, Terry Durod. Oh, Durod. You coached yeah. Durod at, yeah. at UAD. Yeah. So uh, Wilbur McCormick, mm-hmm. uh, Jeff Whitlow, Keith Jackson, uh, Dave Dial, Joe Kapicki, um, Terry Tyler, mm. um, John Long, Toronto Anderson. John Long, okay. Yeah, so there was a lot of great guys on that team. They were stacked. And I was going to say big guys, too. Yeah, he had big guys. He had a big guy, like seven footer named Riley Dotson. I'm mm-hmm. um, not Dotson, but uh, Riley Dotson, but he had a big uh, Bostick. Uh, they had a big. They had big kids. They had mm-hmm. big kids. They were uh, very, very underrated at that time. They beat teams like Marquette, who had mm-hmm. national powers. Uh, they would play North Carolinas. They would play the Georgetown. Now I was there when we played Georgetown. They had Sleepy Floyd mm-hmm. and all of those guys. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so that's who they had. And then Earl Curitan came the year I came as an assistant. Earl Curitan came as well. So, so with this basketball journey, and I know it's like we getting closer, but I'm just so enthralled in your basketball journey. Mm-hmm. When do you start like venturing from basketball into some other things? Because you're like anchored in basketball. I'm guessing you had like a vision of like head coaching or like what was where where do you get into the nightlife part? So, one of the things that had me thinking about basketball, I was listed in Sports Illustrated, and I've been trying to find that Pacific. Magazine, I gave them all to my aunt. I didn't keep things. I gave things mm-hmm. to my grandmother, my aunt, my mother, because I wanted them to be proud of me. So I didn't keep anything I wanted. But I was in Sports Illustrated as one of the top up-and-coming recruiters in the nation, but mm-hmm. I can't find that. But what happened was, by me being a young guy and around all of these older men, they mm-hmm. would take me to places like Joe Strada's club, um, uh, High Chaffarel. So I'm in nightclubs, mm-hmm. and I'm in bars really before I even became 20, but mm-hmm. definitely when I'm 20, 21, I'm running with guys that are in their 40s mm-hmm. or 50s. So I'm sitting in night spots, and I'm trying to figure out why all these men go to these places and drink. But when I saw the money passing hands and the fun they were having, that's when the night thing came in. And so Smokey was from Northeastern High School. Mm-hmm. Some of his alumnus owned together uh, my Fair Lady. And so through conversations, they said, well, during the summers, Keith can come down here and help you with the nightclub. Uh, bouncer, system manager, doorman. Just some, like some yeah. support. So I'm down there and I'm seeing the ladies now. <laughs> you mm-hmm. know, yeah. You know, and I'm not an unknown. They know who yeah. I am because of sports. And I'm loving this, you know. Mm-hmm. But my thing was, how do I get a piece of this? And so uh, the story is is that uh, Smokey left University of Detroit soon after I came, took a job at San Diego State. So, so like, just the bouncing as coaching was prevalent even back in the day. Yes. You know, and, so he's and, been, and even to this day. It's like when you coach, I guess you kind of got a – you got your backpack yeah. to go. Mm-hmm. And, you know, you just got to stay that way. When, when I was recruiting, it was nothing for me to be on the road 14 to 16 days a month. I lived wow. out of suitcases. Wow. I lived out of suitcases. Mm-hmm. And so um, after Smokey signed with San Diego State, and he said, we're we leaving here. I remember going in, the, called us all in the building on Saturday. He said, I just resigned, took a job at San Diego State. He said, you going, you going, you going. Looked at all of us. Okay. And so before I could get settled into San Diego State and get out there, a friend of mine's, called me, and I don't mind using his name, Michael Cash, and he said, Bennett, I found a club out in Southfield that it's, it's, like, it's horrible. They're not doing any business. I met the owner, and I told him about you. I told him, you can fill the place up. Mm-hmm. I said, yeah. He said, yeah. So I go out and I meet the gentleman. And what year is this? This is 70, 
not. So this is even before, like, I guess, I think the boom of Southfield Oak Park for black folks going yeah. out that way is like, what would yeah. you say? That's like 84. Four, 85. 85. Right. Yeah, yeah. So this is even before that. Yeah. This was like when yeah, it was unheard so of. Putting a, a frame of reference. This yeah. would be like doing something in like like Southfield, I imagine, at the time would be like kind of like those those towns around Monroe County it where was it's almost like, like Dearborn. You don't go out there at night uh -huh. and you don't mess up out. Mm -hmm. So I go out there and I meet this gentleman, mm -hmm. this short guy, and he said, I'm told that you could fill my place up. Well, how can we make this arrangement? I said, I'll tell you what we'll do. Give me Thursday nights, and this was like in June until January 1st. Now, I'm thinking, mm -hmm. I want New Year's Eve, too, because <laughs> mm -hmm. that's big money. Yeah. So I'm thinking. He said, okay. And so I created Sports Celebrity Night. Mm -hmm. That's all I knew. Yeah, I was going to say, yeah, you, you know yeah. So and then also because you know the athletes, yes, you've helped uh, curate some introductions yeah. between some of the ladies that want to yeah. meet them, and so, then you can you can kind of get on the phone with them like, hey, I'm doing a party. Yeah. You may want to come to town. And it's like, yeah, I want a party when I'm in town. And so then I knew Smokey and I. Smokey was the head coach of UD, and Charlie Neal, who was the sportscaster at Channel Two. We were all tight. We used to mm -hmm. run together, play trains together. Mm -hmm. So I called Charlie. I gave him the idea. I pitched it to him. I said, would you co-host this event for me? Uh, called Sports Celebrity Night. It's on Thursdays. It's at the Perfect Blend. I gave him the address. He said, sure thing. What do you want me to do? I said, when the out-of-town players come in town. Let them know. Let them know. And this is where they should come. Now, and, already, and you know they want to go somewhere. Yes. And preferably, I would rather go to a place where I can be the star. Because also, I would say the 70s, the 80s, the 90s, the 60s. Detroit does have a prevalent street life dynamic, too. So yeah. it's like. You know, I'm sure it's been, and you probably know more stories than yeah. I do, where a player goes to the wrong place yeah. and ends yeah. up leaving without some chains and some yeah. watches and right. a little bit of cash, you know And, what I'm and so the players would even stay out in Southfield sometime. At mm -hmm. the, the, I think it was Stouffer's across this Northland Inn, mm -hmm. places like So they would be out that way. And so um, there were other people I knew. I, I knew Greg Kelser. I used to, Greg mm -hmm. and I were very, very close for you. I told yeah. him about it. Greg, I need you to bring your boys down. Yeah. And so... So that the, naturally got magic in the house. On the third... Exactly. So on a Thursday right. night, there would be a line outside. Wow. This place wasn't big. Mm. This place only held like about 175. Mm. And it'd be a line outside. And it was people coming from Saginaw, Flint. Mm. And so when... when uh, and I already had met a lot of the Yankees. I knew Roy White. I knew Reggie Jackson. Wow. Through my affiliations. And okay. I, so it wasn't just the basketball players. No, it was no. all of the athletes because you were in that circle. So so when Oakland played, Marcus Allen was in the joint. Wow. You know, and so uh, O.J. Simpson was, was in the joint. I was going to say O.J. probably came. Yeah, Marcus he was came. into that. And mm -hmm. so we had Artis Gilmore mm -hmm. in the place. So this was the place that every athlete Did knew. Dr. J ever show up? No. Okay. But if you were in Detroit near the weekend, and so it, it was on Thursday night, so a lot of the athletes wasn't there on Thursday night, so I had to go back to my man and say, I want Friday nights now. Uh, and so he's looking at the money he's making. She, he's yeah, like, you, you got she, it. You're right. You got it. And so that's how I got my introduction to the night world. And then he opened up a second perfect blend where the Lafayette Orleans used to be. Mm -hmm. And then he opened that up, and then he did some – Stuff. Other stuff or whatever. Yeah, yeah and yeah. then um, yeah. by my by nightlife I, sometimes runs concurrent with street life. Yes. And so <laughs> by that time, my name was kind of popular. I, I, yeah. well, I knew Tommy Hearns and, and Milton McCoy. So this is like as they're ascending towards more yeah. of their, you know, and, and success. so and they told everybody where to come. Yeah. And so you know you got and then you even had the drug dealers. I knew Maserati Rick who mm -hmm. used to run with Tommy and them. Yeah. And so I had a mixture. And then the thing was, don't come here with that mess. Mm -hmm. Don't come in here. Oh, we know how to act, mm -hmm. big fella. We, we, we got you. That's we got funny. you. And mm -hmm. so we all blended in. There was no guns. Mm -hmm. There was no fighting and anything. And so that's what happened. Right? White boy Rick mm -hmm. showed up one night. Mm -hmm. and they was like, you know who out there? So let him in. Mm -hmm. No problem. And so from that, and when the perfect blend went down, Larco's hurt. No, the gentleman who owned... Um, 1940 Chop House at first. Don, Don, um, ah, man. He'll kill me if he knew I, he's dead now. Mm -hmm. But he owned 1940. He wanted to open up another club, Rivertown Dancer for Can you do Thursdays down there? So I was never out of business. It's just that I didn't have my own. And I had 
25% interest in the perfect blend. So, I ended up mm -hmm. parlaying that in the 25% interest in the establishment, too. So when that lie came out that he just fronting, I said, no, I got 25% too, you know. And so um, Larco's, I don't know if you, you're probably too young. Larco's was a supper club that was all the elite white union people would go to, the Jimmy Hoffa's night. And it was on Six Mile right off of Living Noise. So hmm. their business went down as after the riots and after blacks started moving the neighborhood. So they called me. Mm -hmm. And they said, we heard you the guy. They, mm -hmm. We heard you. Can can you turn this into uh, something. something? And I did it. Mm. You know, and so that's how I really got into the business and knew a lot of the local disc jockeys, knew Mojo, knew John Mason, knew all of them. Even though I had my own disc jockeys, I knew all the top disc, disc jockeys in town. Um, but I was not the hottest thing in town. Uh, Charles, yeah, Love, well, I mean, like, Charles Love and yeah. the Funtime Society was back then. I mean, but I grinding. also am, oh, man, you know, Hump's my guy. Yeah. I should have been asked that, that question. Yeah, so they were the big Yo. guys. I was yeah. just based on what I knew, and my footprint uh -huh. was much smaller than them. So I always pay homage to Charles Love and Hump the Grind. They were the guys at that time. He's going to love this. Yo, Hump, I'm hitting you up soon. That's one of my yeah. Another one of my yeah. beloved big homies and OGs. Right. He always would, you and, know, and, show love. And so if I went to a nightclub, I got carte blanche. If they, if I said, tell the owner I'm at the door, oh, he, bring him in. Almost like the same thing that happened in sports moved over to the yeah. nightlife world. Yeah. So as you moved in the nightlife world, what was your relationship with sports? Um, because I'm pretty sure you were still getting I phone was, calls like, hey, do you want to coach this team? So, you want to so coach I, that so team? I, so I did the cardinal sin. I fell in love. <laughs> <laughs> and so my uh, girlfriend at the time was a plumber apprentice. Hmm. I didn't even know what that meant. I just knew she was fun. She worked hard. She was gorgeous. And we just had a good time. And so coaches were calling. And then we got married about a year and a half later. Mm -hmm. And so one day I got home and she said, uh, this guy called you. And I looked at it. It was Rick Majerus, hmm. University of Utah. Hmm. So I called him back. He said, man, I'm going to send your kids some stuff. But I need to talk to you. I said, what do you want to talk to me about? He said, I need you to come out here and be my assistant. He said, I, I have to have you. Mm. I have to have you. So I got off the phone. I started talking to my wife at the time and my stepkids. I had two, boy and a girl. And they started crying. My wife said, you know, I'm just getting into my apprenticeship, my career, and I got to give it up. And so I made the ultimate sacrifice to say that I can be successful without being that deep in basketball. Mm hmm uh, hustling and grinding before it was popular <laughs> on the nightclub scene. And so that's when I got and made the transition in that way. And then so I'm working part-time at Boysville of Michigan, even when I'm coaching. Mm -hmm. And so because I always had an affection for kids that were trouble. And so I got a full-time job at Boysville of Michigan. And when they found out that I knew a lot of the young athletes. boys. Athletes. Yeah. They found, and no, from the, no street, athletes, the street guys. They knew I knew a lot of the young boys incorporated guys. Mm -hmm. And so when they would bring them, the real young boys in there, they would put them in, under my care to talk to them. And so that became kind of popular. And so uh, Father Cunningham, who was close to St. Cecilia's. Right down the street Father from me. Finney, Focus Hope, one of the Focus Hope founders. So I worked at Focus Hope, too. That's mm -hmm. another thing. Yeah. Under Father Cunningham. So what happened was he came to me and he said, I hear you are great at teaching young boys how to play basketball. He said, I heard you are fabulous. You know how Father Cunningham. Yeah. Said, I heard you. I mean, I, most of my stories of him, because my relationship, and I've shared this with you before, was with Eleanor, rest in peace. That yeah. was like, you know, one, yeah. another one of my OGs. Yeah. And I still wonder how and why, but it ended up happening. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. Um, I knew her and her husband, because the mm -hmm. hunter owned a, a hobby center on Wyoming near Tyre. Mm -hmm. He used to do the trains and things. So when he said that, I said, yeah. He, and he said this, and he walked away. He said, but they're failing at life. Mm. He walked away. I didn't think nothing about it. It didn't mean anything mm -hmm. to me. And about two years later, he called me and said, I got this position. I need you to look at it. And so I looked at it, and that's how I got the focus. Oh, that's how I started working. And so in my interview process, they told me what skills translated to working with returning citizens. Mm. They said, you're the perfect guy. For them, number one, they love sports. <laughs> yeah. 
because you can talk their language and they love the nightlife. Nightlife, and all that. yeah. So you've been there. Mm -hmm. You educate, and I got my degree by that time, one degree. So you're educated enough. You know, kind of workforce development. You've been moving people around and things. So that's how I start working with returning citizens at Focus Hope and their Machinist Training Institute. And I'm going to bring you back as, as we get closer to the end, because I want to get like so many people know that story of you mm -hmm. to flip the script. Mm -hmm. And I know just from talking to you and I love basketball, too. Mm -hmm. Actually, we may have to do a, um, a, a watch party one day of some basketball. Well, you tell days, me and so. I get the old U of D gang in here and some of the old guys. Oh, in, man. And we can talk. We can talk about that. I, I would love to um, be, because just in styles and stuff like that. And I love the the like to me. The, my two favorite sports, boxing and basketball, and I obviously, like, football, you know, I got turned off more. Like, the Kaepernick thing, I was already on the fence, and I still watch a game here or there, but it's like it's the game's just changed so much than what I, I grew up liking in football, and I think it's changed the way to play. So, and I'm not saying basketball hasn't changed, but basketball still feels like it's a, it's a dance. It's an art form, yeah. just like boxing. It feels like a – it feels like a a, a a a style, like a like a like a orchestra yes. when it's when it's it working it together. Is. Whereas football is so bam, bam, yes. it's like it is, it is, you know. And so I got tied in the football because of my nightlife work in my past. Because Charlie Neal, who was a sportscast at TV mm -hmm. too, when Billy Sims got drafted, yeah. And so I'm watching him play college ball, and you know, mm -hmm. I mean, the guy's bad. Yeah. And so Charlie told me, he said, like, I'm going to bring Billy by your house one day. Yeah. Who? Billy Sims. Mm -hmm. I said, okay. So that didn't happen. He said, I'm going to have him at the club. So he came out at the club. We met. And so that night he told me, he said, man, you know, uh, I got to bring my wife to town to find her a house and everything. And, you and know. Basically the, the, the support because even then, like today, and maybe even more so now, mm -hmm. I mean, everybody talking about the Jalen Brown contract, like mm -hmm. athletes can be preyed upon. From like usually they make it seem like it's the girlfriends mm -hmm. and it's the the, oh. the friends and the family, which that plays a role. But mm -hmm. as we saw in that lawsuit, that people really don't talk about a whole lot. But mm -hmm. it's a lot of these agents, mm -hmm. these managers, these attorneys that consistently are exploiting and preying on different things happening with mm -hmm. a lot of these athletes. And see, Charlie Neal was big in black college sports, black mm -hmm. college basketball. He used to do all the the black college sports narrating and on the air stuff. So he knew a lot of these guys. And so he put me and Billy together intentionally. So Billy said, I got to bring my wife in town to find a house, but I'm busy, man. They got us at this camp. Well, he used to call it work. That was the first time I ever heard an athlete say, I got to go to work. Because the first time he left the club and say, man, I got to get out. I got to go to work tomorrow. I look at him, you don't work. He said, what do you think I do? Yeah. I work. And he said, he asked me, he said, his wife's name was Belinda. He said, can you show her around? Can I trust you to show her around and be on call? And if she needs some show, I said, oh, you got, I got that. So that's how he and I became close, very tight. Mm -hmm. And so that, then he started bringing all, of course, if Billy at the club, then you got the all other the other lines. guys. Yeah, 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 you got all the other guys start showing up. And all the, and I mean, he hell of an athlete, so he's connected to all the other guys in yeah. the NFL. Yeah. But, and then the women started coming. So well, the perfect blend was known for women. You could mm -hmm. look in there, and at any time, 75% of what you saw in the place, in the hallways, outside, were women. Mm -hmm. And so that's what was going on there. So so I do want to close on this, like, because you coming back sooner than later, like, like probably like September to put these okay. together. Um, as you're connecting these lives, because you're right, like Father Cunningham saw that, like mm -hmm. athletics, nightlife. And then even knowing a lot of guys from street life through that, like the right orientation. I had worked for St. Cecilia, so the Catholic Archdiocese knew of me too and vouched for me. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but as this is all coming together, um, this is also during a time like the 80s was like late 70s, early 80s is such a staggering time of the way drugs are impacting our community. And... Um, and it's not like heroin. I mean, heroin and the methadone clinics and Vietnam. I mean, that that was real. But that was like a different arc of like even how people looked at it. But mm -hmm. you're in nightlife. Mm -hmm. um, 
and, and 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 that's one thing I liked about that show that just ended it with Snowfall, especially like the earlier seasons. I think put a right frame of reference for mm-hmm. crack cocaine they did. They did. of like. Because cocaine was seen as the glamour party drug, almost like champagne. That's what the athletes use. Yes. So it was like, okay, this is like a cheaper version mm-hmm. of champagne without really knowing the impacts of what would happen. Like a lot of the peel form that's impacting a lot of young people today. So our people would look, just our regular people would look at the entertainers and mm-hmm. athletes using cocaine. Can't afford it. Yeah. So when crack came out, and we always want to emulate yeah, those guys. Lifestyles are rich and famous. There it is. And now this is like a, a, a cheaper version yeah, of this. Right. So, and we talk about like, you know, like people always make it seem like the black community pre crack and before, you know, pre and post crack, in mm-hmm. which it did have an impact. Oh, major. Um, but you're in the mix of this nightlife and sports. And so many players, I was reading, um, like, I was reading about Roy Tarpley, and, and especially, I think, a lot of the basketball guys. Mm-hmm. That same stanza or that same. Last Dance documentary starts where Michael Jordan, they like, Michael Jordan looked at all these people using drugs and da 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 But, mm-hmm. I mean, just the people we know, like Spence with his struggles, David Thompson. Um, you know, some of these people that are like, you know, arguably like, you know, like, and, and I just want to say because these people are your peers and you're watching them and you know their athletics, even Kurt Jones himself, like, as you're seeing this happen right before your eyes, I... I What's your orientation at what you're looking at? How do you, how do you like, you know what I'm saying? Try to like pull somebody back in and and, and like, do you even see that connection? Like, how are you processing? So, so without giving names, yeah, because some of them are dead and gone. Yeah, there were Detroit Pistons that were strung out at that time, especially Mm -hmm. in the middle seventies, who I was very close to, who would sometimes I used to coach the house team at Saint Cecilia during the men's pro division. That was another thing that polarized me. So here's a young guy who's coaching Campy Russell, <laughs> some of the pros. And even, Younger like, I, I'm going to throw another name out there that people may be able to tie just because of who his son is. Even the stories I hear about Jalen's dad, Jalen Rose's father, mm-hmm. and how good he was. And I'm guessing you had to have known him. Yeah, I saw him. But I didn't know him personally, but I okay. saw him, I mm-hmm. mean, as close as we are, watching yeah. him play ball and stuff. And um, so what happened was I would befriend them, and I would try to talk to them in the locker room. And a lot of them just loved me for whatever reason it was. And so they would even call me if they got, I mean, here's I'm a kid, and they would ask me for $20. Can you loan me 15 or $20? Mm. So my thing was I would rather give them the 15 or 20 than have them go out there and get robbed or roll. And, and I don't want to mention names because a lot of people in the sports community at this time, at that time, know who I would be talking to, and they probably even can imagine. Put two and two together if they yeah, really know. Who, who I'm talking to. Uh, it was very difficult. Uh, it was hurtful. Hmm. Uh, it was painful. And to have known a lot of the guys who were h- kind of high up in YBI and then some of the lower guys, I'm trying to put my arm around all of this. And like, I start, that's how I really got into what you know me for the last people around the city for the last 30 years. How do I help this situation? Hmm. How do I help my young brothers? How do I help brothers? How do I help them bounce back? When so many guys start being incarcerated in the early 80s, even ball players would be in, like, how do, how, what are they going to come out to? They need something to come out to. So one of the standards I use in the nightclub business, I use run and flip the script. Guys, this is neutral ground. This is no drug zone. Respect me, and I, I've been respecting y'all all these years, right? Yeah. Respect this place. Respect. So I got to push back with this question with you saying that because it's like the late 70s, mm-hmm. the 80s. Mm-hmm. It's women around because that's the other thing about like I, I often tell people alcohol and drug culture kind of like like it, it's like a mix of nightlife is kind of like a a, a, a a veil for <laughs> a veil for hooking up. It's, it's, a, it's mm-hmm. a veil for sex life. Oh, yeah. And, 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 and the alcohol and drugs go coincide. Like most stories I hear about guys when they say, yeah, you know. Mm-hmm. I first tried show cocaine because she said it had some. Well, well, and then I hear that from a lot of women, too. So you were running an establishment that was successful to say a no drug. I'm, I'm sure they – how did you enforce something like that at that time, I guess I would say? It's the standard that you keep because a, a lot of establishment owners back then, managers, was doing doing themselves. Mm. I kept clean. Mm-hmm. Turned down opportunities to do things like so they saw it. Then I had enough clean ball players. You know, you have Isaiah Thomas and them out there. They clean. 
Mm -hmm. And so you got to respect what you see in the room. Now, I have heard some wild stories about Isaiah yeah. Thomas and gambling. Yeah. Oh, but, yeah. you know, I mean, well, I think that's the competitive edge yeah. sometimes. And so I'm not dumb enough to know that they didn't go to the parking lot Yeah. and, and do what they had to do. But that's out there. Yeah. And then sometimes you see a man and a woman leave the club and go to the parking lot, come back in for it. So I'm not dumb, mm -hmm. you know, but it was never going. So here's what I'll share with you. You had, I, I mentioned the white boy Ricks. You've had Maserati Ricks. I could name some others. And you mentioned liquor. You mentioned women. Never a shooting. Mm. The only gun that ever got pulled out at the perfect blend was on me. Let's leave it right there, and we're going to pick up that story. I didn't even get to my classic stories, but y'all, man, man, man. This is going to be, like I say, it, it's rare to have a back-to-back, -back, but mm -hmm. it's just so much to share. And I don't know if people get you to unpack so much like this. And thank you so much for this. You know what I'm saying? Especially leading up before this collard green cook-off. Man, I got some cool OGs, man. Oh, I, you I'm, know, I'm, I'm here for the collard green cook-off. In, in reality, too, we kind of connected through Charlene's show last year, yes. but we knew of each other. Yeah. And from we fellowship. spoke for hours yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. when we did connect. So I can't wait to... let. Pulled the gun on you. See, he even know how to leave a story with the, with the cliffhanger because y'all know Kari got a million questions about that. But we're going to come back with that too, man. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you, man. And part two is coming very, very soon. Detroit is different. Appreciate you. Detroit you, is different you. is Peace. where you get information, artistry, history, music, and even comedy. Detroit is different, a home for the culture of Detroit. Visit online at DetroitIsDifferent.com today.